Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. I found my way home across the Grand Mirage. Hi. Look at this guys. Hi, I'm Allison Arngrim, and this is the Allison Arngrim Show. And I'm Allison Arngrim, and you may recognize me as Nilly Olson from Little House on the Prairie, but tonight I'm Allison Arngrim. And we, on the Allison Arngrim Show, talk about really interesting stuff. We talk about things that make you feel good, the TV shows and the movies that made you feel good, and the people who were in them, and people who are doing really interesting, cool things to make the world a better place. And I have an incredibly interesting person coming on tonight. Uh, Tom Beards was on Young and the Restless. He was on many, many television shows, a real heartthrob, and he was one of the first openly gay soap opera stars. And he wrote a book a while back called Forgiving Troy about his brother, who was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenic, who murdered their mother. And he wrote an incredible book about this experience. And then, in addition to this, he paints incredible paintings. And now, he's written another book. And this one is called Young, Gay, and Restless. And it's about his career and, well, sex. So this is going to be a really interesting show. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hey, thanks so much. So before we get started on yes, all sir. that stuff, I want to say that you've got a great reputation. Everybody Thank you. likes you. And oh. do, you, do you remember that we, we met on a movie we set once? We did. We've actually met. We were in a movie together. And, and when, when Harlan That's said, right. he said you were in the movie, I went, wait, oh my God, the last place on earth. We were in that. You were, That's right. You yeah. were, uh, I didn't expect you to remember me because I was horrible and socially angry. <laughs> and just whatever, totally forgettable. Well, I had to literally. But I finally got to meet you. And because everybody has told me, you know, how nice oh. Allison is. And, well, and, thank you. And you've got such a great reputation. I just wanted to tell well, you Well, I had to go back and look. Who, wait, who was he? But it was the, the scene where it's the 10th the wedding anniversary of a gay couple. And you were one of the yes. grooms. And I was yeah. your friend who's like, ah, here's to them. Ah, that's gay. And, and making a big toast. And you were adorable right. and delightful. And it was fun. We did the party scene. It was awesome. Yeah, excellent. Actually, cool, cool. So we have yeah. actually, right. we, are, okay. we are less than two degrees of separation. We have actually been on screen together. That's right. And we've been in person. That's right. Yep. So yep. you're just reading, just even trying to read your, your press release. It's amazing. It's just, oh, wow. It goes on and on and on. It does. It's okay. just all of this <laughs> happened in one person's <laughs> life. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Well, you know what? It, it, it kind of seems like a lot. You know, the other night I was just lying in bed, as you know, uh, uh, not being able to sleep as I do. And, and that, that particular night I went over everything in my book thinking, how would this come across to somebody that doesn't know me? And it's all so weird. <laughs> it's all so bizarre. But to me, it's not. You know, it's my life. Well, that's what's so weird about writing an autobiography is I just like, okay, now I'm putting this out there and people are going to be looking at me very strangely. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, I'll, I'll just give you some of the pointers now. You know, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just uh, free stream here. Go for uh, it. Right. I mean, I grew up in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I was gay. This was the 60s and mm. the 70s. I was closeted. I thought I was the only one going to hell, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, wrote a letter to God at 18. Dear Aww. God, I'm gay. I'm going to be an important man. Kill me in my sleep before I'm 18 if that's really uh, bad. Uh, and he didn't, and I thought, cool. Oh, good. Okay, so you got a sign. You got a <laughs> sign. It was all right. Thank yeah. heavens. Right. Right. Then I bartended in gay bars in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, actually where Jeffrey Dahmer used to go. Right. And I was like, reading uh, about that. You... You got lucky. You were hanging out in the same bars where, where Jeffrey Dahmer was finding his victims and killing and cooking people. Right. And you were a very good exactly. looking young gay man. So how did you how did you manage to miss that horror train? 
And if he would have asked me over for dinner, I would have gone, not knowing I'm the dinner. Whoa. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, I mean, I, I was involved at the time. And, uh, you know, I took many chances in, in, my, in my life. And I talk about that in my book. It's like when I'm 21 and I'm in Hollywood and uh, uh, one guy... I'm busting tables at a restaurant, and he says, hey, you know, I may know a manager that could help you. So, yeah, I go to his house, and he does. He actually sets me up with Rob Lowe's manager like a couple weeks later. That worked out. However, when I'm in uh, The Revolver, when I'm 21 years old in my cowboy hat, saying I came here to be a movie star, and a photographer says, hey, why don't you come over to my place? I can show you uh, some headshots. I can give you some free headshots. And you can take a look at what uh, what are professional headshots. So I go over there. He drugs me. As I'm falling unconscious, he's removing my pants. He's blowing me. Uh, I lose consciousness. The next morning, I try to dress. I hit two cars on the way home. Jesus. And uh, instead of calling the cops, because I'm only 21, and I don't have a lot of experience, I don't think, oh, he's a serial rapist or something. I just think, hey, I'm in Hollywood. He told me he'd give me free headshots. Yeah, the night sucked and he was a creep, but I want those free headshots. And so I called him. And, did, did, and you I got were those like, free this headshots. is what Hollywood is. You just thought, well, I guess that's how they do things here. Uh, I, I didn't know, but I thought, hey, you know, what's the best outcome now? You know? <laughs> and and I, I wanted to be a movie star, so I needed good headshots. And that's, that's why I can relate to some of the Cosby accusers now. Because they hung around him after he assaulted them. They wanted to keep their you career know? going. They're like, well, Ian Kay, but I still want to work. Blech. Yeah, and they probably kept their distance from him. Didn't take another cappuccino, if you know what I mean. Well, right. Well, see, and that's why when I was growing up in Hollywood, that was one advantage I had. My parents were in the business, and my father was a manager. And the constant refrain I got as a teenager in my 20s was, the meeting is never at their house. The meeting is never at the hotel. The meeting is in their office in the daytime, and we're coming with you. And I remember oh. thinking, gosh, he's paranoid. And, of course, then, you know, later I was like, oh, duh. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, how would you know as a little kid or as a teenager? How would you know that and, there's lecherous individuals out there? Yeah. And it was sort of taken for granted that that would happen. And so it was like, yeah, we're just going to, yeah, it's not going to happen to you. Not this week, you know. And uh, he was, I remember him uh, talking to other clients and other women like, no, no, you're not alone with a photographer. You're not alone here. And and a lot of people were like, oh, he's really being a stick in the mud about this. But now in retrospect, of course, everyone's like, going, oh, well, thank heavens, you know. But yeah, that's, that's uh -huh. how things were. And a 21-year-old good-looking guy in Hollywood, yeah. Yeah, I bet you got asked everybody's house. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I was pursued by David Geffen. Oh boy! Uh, I was working to Gallagher's house restaurant in Kennedy. So uh, David wants to go out with him, and I'm like, "Who's David Geffen?" Oh, who's David Geffen? He made Tom Cruise a star. So I said, "Oh, go out with him." <laughs> well, I didn't think. And I was only 21. I didn't think it was. Uh, anything other than oh he could make me a movie star I think there would be an exchange he never he never offered he put the move on me and I and that was it oh, oh we there's a paid for one his friend they hang around me and just of course he didn't wait is he breaking up are you there I'm just checking things here. Are you there? Did, Did I bore you? Oh no, God, no. Bored. It just <laughs> the phone was got weird on us. Can we fix it? Can you hear him? Okay. Okay, so he's coming. Okay, I just got he got a little wonky in my headphones. All right. Okay, we've got you. Yes, there. I was like, you know, worried we we're going to lose you, and it was just getting good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but uh, but even though I, I mean, yeah, I was a successful successful actor for a while. And I've been a successful artist for a while, but as an artist, there's no guaranteed income. Mm -mm. And most of my life, it's been like, hey, how? When is rent going to get here? You know. Really? So, yeah. So I could look back and think, oh, I should have married a billionaire. I should have married a millionaire. <laughs> but, but I've, I've really been happy because I'm always in this creative vortex, doing what I want to do with grand expectations. And and that's really cool. I heard part of an interview you did recently where you talked about 
really the difference between an act being an actor and being an artist that being an artist is more about expressing the real you and in, in yourself as opposed to playing someone sure i mean because when you're an actor they tell you what to wear they put your makeup they tell you how to wear your hair you have to say what they want you to say and they tell you how to say it right you know? it's, it's the director's artist, if you're thing lucky, Say what? Well, it's in case you, then it's, yeah, it's the director is expressing himself and the producer and the makeup artist and the costumer, and you're like one of the bunch yeah. of people in that way. Whereas an artist, yeah, it's, it's more you. Yeah, as an actor, you have an assignment. I mean, there's something very specific they want you to do. As an artist, if you're lucky, you can, you can really spill your subconscious. You can do something really organic and unique, which is great when I do that, but more often than not, I'm, I'm assigned to paint portraits. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm doing a service. I'm providing somebody with something they want very specifically, which is not as fun as when you're just really just, you know, venting and well, going I, crazy on a canvas. I think that's why, although, I mean, I guess well, when I, I act, I like acting because it's like, well, I'm somebody else. But I do like the stand-up comedy because then that's more... That's more expressing my stuff. That's way, that's I'm wow. not having to, like, say, do this, do that. I go, oh, I can do whatever I like now. And, uh, yeah, so I, I definitely got that difference. It's it's a whole other, more satisfying kind of genre. Do you do a lot of stand-up? I do. I have a one-woman show called Confessions of a Prairie Bitch that I travel with. Uh -huh. That's a book, too, right? Indeed, yes. I, I Actually, it's weird. I did the show first and then the book. Oh, okay. Okay. Are you going to, do you think you'll do a one person show of your book? Oh, I, I don't think so. That would be a really terrifying concept. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you like people. I don't know if you're an extrovert or not, but you seem very comfortable in front of people, but I really wouldn't want that for me. And your book is definitely very personal. Now, now I'm reading about this. Okay, young, gay, and and restless. Very personal stuff that you talk about here. Your reviews have referred to it as. You know everything from shockingly honest to wet and sticky, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's a hell of a review. So it's a, a sexual memoir. Oh, yeah. What is that like to write a sexual memoir? Oh, it's kind of funny because <laughs> I never thought my sexual life was that interesting <laughs> until I wrote it. And the reason it's interesting is because I'm neurotic. I'm amusing. <laughs> I, I was naive, and I had a great deal of integrity coming from Wisconsin. So it's kind of funny to see where I go, who I sleep with, what I do, and, uh, you know, the patterns of my relationship. But I'm also really bold, you know. I, I talk about I had fat injected in my penis when I was 30. I was having a... Uh, I, I was reading about the plastic surgery. That's fascinating. Yeah, Why? Why? I was reading where you said you had all these plastic surgery procedures, and I keep thinking, but you're such a you know, right. good-looking guy. What did you have? What was left to fix? You looked good to me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. And, you know, I, I had some good camera angles. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I felt I was too skinny because the mm. TV adds weight. So uh, I tried to widen my jaw with some silicone and stuff and had some buckling to make it more square. Had my ears pinned back, had the fake teeth put in, yeah, the yeah. veneers, and had lipo. And then I, I said, Doc, let's take some of this uh, fat from my stomach and put it in my penis. And this is something I never told any of my boyfriends. Right? Did and it I work? I to say is this the... in the book. Say what? But did it work? That's the key thing. Did it, it work? Did, work? did it actually make your penis bigger? It, it did. It made it... Uh, straighter it was a little curved and it made it a little longer and thicker and so I, i'm fine with that you know i had i had no problem with that and i never told anybody I, I in the book i also talk about fantasies which people don't talk about today mm -mm. i talk about incest fantasies mm. that i i always wanted that i i craved having sex with uh, the men in my family, which never happened. Wow. And I think that's because, yeah, I didn't feel like I, belo I belonged. I didn't feel loved. I didn't, you know, I felt, I don't know, I just... Uh, so was it more whatever. like a craving for a connection? Yes, it was a craving for a connection. And this is the conversation that needs to be out there. We can't keep pointing our fingers at people if, if and say, oh, you should be shamed for that fantasy or for that thought or for that action you know i didn't hurt anybody and i didn't have any incest 
But the point is, I'm at a place, I live in the woods, I don't care if I see people again, I'm happy, <laughs> I'm on a spiritual journey. I don't care what people think of me. I can say what I want in this book, and that's why it's so damn honest. It's, well, that's, it, uh, that's the ultimate freedom, yeah. is when you don't, no longer care what people think. That is, I had right. someone once ask me, uh, do, do you have uh, fuck you money? And I said, you know, if you really <laughs> know who you are and you know what you want... A dollar ninety eight can be fuck you money. Oh, that's a great answer. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, yeah. I'm reminded of, of uh, Betty Page, the pinup. Do you remember Betty Page and those fabulous pictures? Yeah. Well, w- well, that was the thing is that she had everything she wanted when she was older, and then people discovered that she was still around and the photos and everything, and she didn't really go public. She said, no, you want to look at that girl from the pictures from 50 years ago. And... She said, no, I, I have everything. She, she like, made her own clothes, and she had certain things she liked to do, and she had a nice little place. And she said, I don't really need a lot of money. This is all I need. They got her some money from the photos because she's older and could use it for medical stuff. But she said, no, I, I, I watch TV. I go to church. I go to the movies. I did this is what I do. I make my clothes. I, I don't drink. Da-da. And so people kept offering her things. They would offer her money to come go public and come be on a show. And she'd go, no, that's okay. And people would try to threaten her. They're going to expose her. And she'd go, expose me? What? You've already seen all my photos. What are you talking about? And <laughs> she was amazing because I thought, I said, she's like the last free person on earth. She can't be bought mm. or threatened. And you could not threaten right. or buy Betty Page. She said, I am Betty Page and this is who I am and uh, whatever. Go think what you like. Uh-huh. It was brilliant. Uh-huh. Interesting. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, and, and part of my book, I do, I do think people find my book liberating, because you know I do touch on taboo subjects, and and I say through it, you know, is sex still naughty? Is sex still naughty? Is it right? And I want them, yeah. At the end of the book, I want them to rethink that, because what good is it uh, when we're all on Facebook? saying, you're naughty, you're naughty, you're naughty, you're naughty, you think different than I am, you're naughty, you're a different political affiliation, you're naughty, she posed naked, she's naughty. I mean, come on, we're adults here. And it seems like there's so much of that finger waving, right? Well, and it goes in weird phases. The pendulum goes back and forth between, like, sexual freedom and puritanism. And, in fact, well, my friend Charlotte Stewart, was Miss Beetle on Little House, wrote a book, and she talked openly about a lot of her sexual relationships. And she even, at one point in the book, there's almost a disclaimer. She says, okay, if you're reading this book and you're much younger than I am, uh, people who were around in the 60s and 70s, this is what we did. <laughs> And kind of explain, if this sounds like I'm having a lot of sex, I'm really not. It was just, it was the 70s. And and she, she was, because she was, a lot of her younger fans were like, oh my God, they were, sh- Miss Beetle did what? And she's like, no, really, this wasn't that like shocking at the time. This was totally normal. But there is a double standard still. Oh, yeah. I say in the book, I, I've probably been with 200 guys. Right. If you tell people you've been with 200 oh, guys, yeah, people right. are going to think, that you're a big hole. <laughs> right? It's completely different. Right? It's, there's a different standard completely for different. men and women, and there's a different standard for gay men that they go, well, he's a gay guy. Well, of course he had sex with 200 guys. Uh, you know, this assumption uh-huh. of it. But it, it's fascinating. Now, um, you also, of course, your previous book was pretty heavy going. Um, your family's yeah. really been hit with the by mental illness. You really had a time of it there. Yeah, uh, I wrote Forgiving Troy about 10 years ago, and that's a book I had to write. Yeah. Because my paranoid schizophrenic brother killed our wonderful mom way back in 1989. Mm. And uh, it took me, I had a miraculous journey to reunite with him, to go to his prison, uh, where he was no longer this mean asshole. He was, who could kill me, because he was a black belt, and he threatened to. He had... Um, become this babbling, incoherent, non-existent Ugh. being. He like hardly was there. And I showed up and I got him medication. He started to come around, regress like a little boy, mm. saying, Tommy, when we go to heaven, where do we go bathroom? You know, and stuff oh like my that. God. Got him to a point of remorse where 70% of boys that kill their mom never get there. So, you know, it was an incredible journey that we had together because I was also going through social anxiety and nobody could identify more than 
paranoid schizophrenic brother. Well, and you know, and so. the trauma you must have been going through with the, the, your mother being, I mean, it had, you were suffering too. Well, I always believed in life after death, seriously. Okay, good. So I handled it, handled it a little different. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but that was a book that I, I had to write, and... I, I wasn't even going to say I was gay when I first started writing it. Wow. And then my brother-in-law was like, well, look, you're, you're, you're divulging all the family secrets. You've got to come out. And I thought, well, he's right. But we're going to talk about all that. What, at that point, being gay is, is kind of a, you know, a letdown almost. It's like this isn't even the most exciting thing in here. Well, maybe to the reader, but he uh-huh. was still taking a chance with my career because all I wanted to be That's was right. an actor at that point. You know, so I did take the high road and go with the truth, whether it hurt my career or not. And I also shared other very embarrassing stuff in that book. I abused an animal 30 yeah. years ago, and I'm still deeply embarrassed about it. But I shared that because I, because it was important for people to get the whole scope of the family. And you want, you know? and that's the thing, you yeah. clearly aren't someone who's keeping their secrets. No, no, no. It's no get not. it out, no, get and, it all out. And I get so much support when I share embarrassing stuff. People should do it more often. They should surprise. Well, I, you know, I've always had a motto. I always say, it, you know, avoid blackmail, admit to everything. And, you know, <laughs> okay. my comedy show's a bit lighter than that, but it is confessions. That's why I said that's why it's all called confessions, because it's I confess to more silly and embarrassing things. But absolutely, I think getting it all out there. I mean, you've really gone above and beyond what most people would think of when they say they're going to let it all out. But you've really let it all out. I do. I do. Uh, this book, Young, Gay, and Restless, My Scandals, On-Screen and Off-Screen Sexual Liberations, is almost, a, it could be a deathbed confession. <laughs> it's, that, it's that vulnerable and open, you know. But I, I have to say that I, I don't embarrass other people. And if I do, I try to change their names in it because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and I don't have any axes to grind. That's not what I'm about. Well, that's very nice of you. Yeah. I mean, what's the point? No, <laughs> not help anything. Yeah. Now, you've also, you, how long have you been painting? Because I've been looking on, on the website at some of your incredible paintings. Very, very, very interesting stuff. Thanks. All my life I've been painting. But in 2004, Scarlett Johansson, uh, hosted a gallery opening of mine for Art of Elysium Charity. And about that time, I became, I started to make a living at it. So for like 15 years, I've made a living as an artist, which is why I could leave Hollywood. You know, mm-hmm. I could go anywhere and still have my income through Facebook and portraits. Nice. So uh, that's why I could escape to Lake Arrowhead, where I live now. And I just love it here. And then, and then what kind of things, I mean, when you're not doing portraits, someone says, oh, you yeah, do my portrait. But when you're just painting what you want to paint, what do you paint? Oh, that would be like my Blue X series. I've got a hundred of those paintings up there. Uh, I like expressionism, mm-hmm. you know, so it's not really, you can tell that there's a figure, but it's distorted or, you know, it's not realism. It's not impressionism. It's just more eventful, emotional, almost art brute or insider art kind of stuff. Nice. That would be my best stuff, I think. Now, yeah. But I'm also a, a really uh, creative writer. And I, I've got another book coming out in a month, which is uh, How Men Really Feel About Being Sexually Assaulted. Wow. Wait, you, so, a third uh, a third book on top of these two. Oh, I've got another one too. I've got a fourth book, and I'll do three <laughs> next year. Now that I know how to, now that I know how to self-publish, right I was now waiting you're... for a publisher. Oh, right. So now you're and... like, oh, well, I can do the writing thing now. Boom. So now we're gonna get like four books. Fuck that. Can I use the word fuck? Yeah, you can say that on the show. Yeah, fuck that. I've been writing since I was twenty-three. <laughs> fuck that. I've been waiting for a publisher. Fuck that. And they turned down Young Gay and Restless because it's not commercial. But now I learned how to do it, and I'm going to make more money doing it myself. And now I've got tons of books that uh, I've already written that I'm going to upload on Amazon very soon. I also think it's going to be wildly commercial. 
I mean, you were on Young and the Restless for a very long time. You were on all these other shows. You've been in all these movies and all these TV shows. People have know who you are. And it's like, wait, it's oh, my God, it's that guy. And then, hello, you're talking about sex. And I'm not sure that anybody's really gone broke talking about sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if they've talked about uh, the gay journey, but <laughs> I'm surprised that women are really enjoying it. Because I thought, oh, only gay guys will like this. And they'll <laughs> right. be inspired by it. But no, the, the straight women, they're liking it. And I thought, wow, I didn't even know if they would keep their interest. But, but it, it maybe I do find a lot of women, I know I've had the same thing, we can sometimes feel like we relate somewhat to gay men more than like a straight man you know as many straight Ooh. men will say no well I, I, okay i okay. like my gay friends but i can't really relate but as well we're we're people who are having sex with men so we can go oh, okay we you know and and we get oh. discriminated against and we get treated like crap so we have we have some things in common <laughs> okay yeah good points good points i don't know if straight men and lesbians really relate to each other in the same way but often gay men, <laughs> gay men and women can sort of go eh, i can see what you're talking about uh-huh. But yeah, no, I'm I, I have not. I'm dying to read it. Um, I'm amazed. Um, now it says you're the f- first openly gay contract player on a major daytime drama. I mean, obviously now at this point we think, oh, there's a lot of people who've come out who were in daytime. But uh-huh. your book what was it? Was well, well, did you really come well, out? Was what it with, was with, so cool? Yeah. About, what was so cool about that is initially I was in the closet. Right. My character died. And then 20 years after I was dead, I contacted the show and I said, look, I know you've got somebody leaving and I'm wondering if I can come back and make my character gay. And we can say that he faked his death. <laughs> and they liked the, the, uh, they liked the storyline and we did that. So it was cool that I could go back 20 years later to a job where I was one way mm-hmm. and come back a whole different way, proud, grown up. You know more of me, but I was disappointed that they squelch they squelched uh, the gay storyline. Oh, they so, did. Uh, yeah, they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we had a few weeks uh, where I said some really good stuff, but it was all a planned surprise for May Sweep. So <laughs> the Netflix, no, nobody really knew about it. So I don't know. You know, I don't know why they decided that it was naughty. But apparently it was naughty, so... Uh, that's well, and, and it's a soap opera, but, and you would think, okay, so you're going to have a character fake his death and come back 20 years later, but when it's too shocking, he's gay? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right? Genoa City, uh, go figure. Hey. <laughs> Whatever. But so you were out, I guess, really with the Forgiving Troy book. Was that when you came out uh, for, for the general public? Mm, yeah. Around then? That's okay. Right. Now, what yeah. what what were what, what was the reaction like? Because I know, I mean, it's it's changed so much. But by you know, two thousand nine, at least, thank God, was not like being nineteen seventy six. Um, but it's still even more different now. What was it a positive reaction? What kind of results did you get? Uh well, I wasn't really doing a lot of acting at that ah, point, okay. so it's not like yeah, it's not like I could really tell. But you know, the people around me supported that. My friends supported that. And the book was well-received. I mean, you won awards for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great book, and there, there's been movie interest for a long time, but no deal at that point. And I'm surprised it, that, that you didn't, because that said that would be a movie. Yeah, Jesus. yeah you know what? You know what? Uh, I should have taken the deal they gave me, and the deal they, they wanted to give me was like, yes, you wrote it, but... Let's just throw that away, and let's have this Oscar-winning writer write it. And I said, no. I said, ah. you know, I'll write it with somebody, but this is what I wrote. So, you know, if I could do it all over again, I would. I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't ask to be treated fairly. I'd say, okay, anything, because you know, it's been so long when I, when, that I've wanted that to be an incredible uh, theatrical success, and it hasn't been. You know, not that I'm complaining, because, you know, I've never been on the street or anything. Uh, my life has been good. I've, had, well, I've always had what I've, what I've wanted. That's always the decision. It's like, okay, do I do this where we get the story told right, told by me, told the way I want it, or do we just say, screw it, okay, we'll get the story told. Someone else will do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess, you know, we, 
Yeah, whatever. <laughs> do now? Do you think you'll get a pr- approach for a movie for this book, the the sex one? I hope so. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really thinking that it's going to be a big hit, especially with gay guys. You know, not just because it, it's jaw dropping, but it's uh, it's funny, it's amusing. There's some dear parts, uh, and, and and essentially. Uh, it's uplifting because I land up happy and healthy and away from it all. Oh, plus, plus the major thing in, in, in the book, which is the major thing in my life, I suppose, is that I've learned that it's not up to somebody else to decide my success. Like yes. the young and the restless said, no, no, the gay storyline stops. No, Tom Beard says it continues. Here, read all about it. You have gay <laughs> wrestling. Hollywood said, no, Tom, you're not going to be a movie star. I said, no, I am going to be a movie star. I made a movie in this cabin several years ago playing five characters. I proved to me I am a movie star. That's what I needed. I needed to believe it, you know. Uh, And a a couple other things like that, I find myself repeating that pattern. And it doesn't matter what somebody else thinks. But, and you become you know, a successful and, and, painter and a successful author, so you seem to be extremely successful. That's right. The publisher said, "No, this is not a commercial book." I said, "Well, I don't care. I'm <laughs> gonna, I'm gonna write the book." I My dad said, "Tom, nobody's gonna want to read about your sex life." Oh yes, said, okay. yes, they are. <laughs> I'm gonna do it anyway. And and I guess so, you said I'm reading the press release, and you have. Um, a Republican congressman getting drunk and Facebook messaging you nude photos? These are like <laughs> highlights. <laughs> Say what? These are like highlights they're, they're putting out there. I would yeah. think that, that yeah, yeah, people are going to buy that book. Okay. Yeah, see, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not offended if anybody sends me naked pictures. You can send me naked pictures <laughs> later. I'm not offended at that. And this Republican congressman knows that. And he has sent me stuff and hit on me before, and I'm just amused by it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not offended. I don't, I, I'm, I don't consider that assault. Now, you haven't taken him up on his offer, though. No, I haven't. No. Just strictly the phone. Wait, you say President, he's, like, still sending you stuff? Uh. Yeah, he's one of my consistent uh, Facebook friends. I've got 10,000 Facebook friends. In fact, he read the book, uh, yeah, before other people did. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I probably won't send you nude photos of myself, but good to know. Okay. I imagine you're going to get a lot more <laughs> from a lot of people when they read this book. <laughs> I would think. What was, was Well, hey, I'm naked in, and it's only fair that they send me naked pictures if they want. Right. Now, what, was there a part of the book that you would say was more difficult than another part to write? I mean, I would think all of it would be difficult to write, but you have a real attitude of, I don't care anymore. I'm just laying it all out. I no longer care. Was there a part that was difficult for you to to reveal? Yeah, it's not only that I just don't care. It's, it's, I think one of my life lessons is don't limit me. Don't mm-hmm. tell me what to do and don't tell me what not to do. That's like a Tom Beach thing. And my friends know that. My lovers certainly know that. So, uh, yeah, that's why it, it wasn't difficult for me to, to write the embarrassing stuff. Uh, probably the most difficult part was just the chronology, you know, just yeah. bringing out oh, when, happened, when that happened, et cetera, arranging that stuff. There's so much. Yeah. We're going, you know, I'm talking... You know, 50 years of uh, sexual stuff. I mean, yeah, I'm 56, so I don't have sex at six years old, but I had sexual ideas at 9, 10, 11, and they're in the book. I'm using stuff. You leave nothing out. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, I don't. I don't. And, <laughs> and, that, and that did concern me. I thought, oh, my God, wow. people are going to get so bored. But no, that hasn't been the reaction. No, no, I don't think so. Now, it's interesting. You've mentioned having social anxiety, and that, but you also, you're. I mean, yes, you've gone off to live in this fabulous place, but you're living in a really, really fabulous place. You're in this gorgeous place up in the mountains. So I don't know. I think we probably none of us would leave the house if we were there. Um, do you find is is this difficult for you for promoting the book or going on book tours? That you know the social anxiety you have to sort of like kind of like pace yourself. Hey. I dedicate the book to tequila <laughs> <laughs> Be- because tequila can change me from
from a neurotic artist to a happy soap star in in an hour. And that's, you know, so if I do have social engagements, that three drinks and I'm who they want to see. <laughs> <laughs> It's medicinal for me. I'm not an alcoholic. I don't it's drink at all. You know, so and I'm you know your exact it. dosage of tequila at this point to get through it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Because I used to do a lot. I used to do a lot of uh, public stuff. I used to paint at charities and stuff, and I have to mm-hmm. be on. And, mm-hmm. So I, I know what that's like, you know. But I do have like a three-hour limit. Uh, how about you? Well, you're not an introvert, though, right? I'm not, yeah, I generally like people, but I do find if I do an event where there's a lot of people, and I was just talking to a friend about doing the autograph events, but like some of the really crazy ones like Chiller, Package, there's so many people that it does become claustrophobic at some point. And uh-huh. I can do it, but I mean, whereas I might be able to go for eight hours or something with a large group of people before I start to feel weird, I do find that when I'm done, especially if it's a lot of people touching me where I was like, well, I need a three hour nap now. I find it does take a lot of out, out of me by the end of the day. Well, that's amazing that you can do like eight hours straight around people. I can't. I mean, it. I will be exhausted oh. if I do that, but I can definitely do three, four hours and it doesn't seem to bother me too much. But, um, I, you know, and I do sometimes have certain events because, well, because a little house on the prairie, I, I have people who sometimes come up and go, your show saved my life. I love this show so much. They're crying. They're talking about Michael Landon. They want to hug me. And I enjoy that. It's, it's lovely. It's beautiful. But yes, after a few hours of that, it's like, okay, I feel like I've been awake for three days. And so it, it does, it is exhausting mentally and emotionally. So I can see where that would go. I can obviously do that. I, I apparently could do that for incredible lengths of time. <laughs> I'm surprised at how long I can do it. Um, but I do generally, I do generally enjoy groups of people and people talking to me. I think if I, if I didn't, the stuff I do, yeah, it would be brutal. I would, I would move to a cabin in the woods. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, I worked with Michael Landon. Did you, did you know that? No, what did you, what were you on? Highway to Heaven. Oh my, my God! Job. You did. You were on Highway to Heaven. I was on Highway to Heaven, and and I got a funny story about that. Yes. We uh, we shoot the the scene that I thought I we were in, uh, and then Michael Landon says, "Okay, now we're going to shoot the next scene outside, and let's block it." And I'm like, "What next scene?" <laughs> and he said, "The Blue Pages." Oh no! Da, da, da. Oh, the blue pages. Oh, I didn't look at the blue pages. Oh, they add scenes. You know, when you do a script or a TV show, and they did. And I, and I said I I didn't even look at those. And he said you've got five minutes to learn them. Boom. And that was it. And that was really all he said. He was very stern. Yep. Yep. And I yep. learned them in five minutes. And it was done. Did, you did, know? So, when, you know, when, I liked him. When he told you but, you had uh, uh, a few minutes to, to, to learn them, did his lips disappear? Say what? When, when, when he <laughs> would turn us, if, 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 if he was having one of his days, it was like a Friday and it was time to get the shot and somebody wasn't ready, he went, okay, just go learn this. It'll be fine. He's, he would sort of flare his <laughs> nostrils and I swear his lips would disappear. He'd like suddenly have no lips and his <laughs> nostrils flare and you go, oh, we're all in trouble now. <laughs> It's like that. Right. If you got that yes, look, it was like perfect. Yes, I, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure they did disappear at that point. When we were in Little House, we often had the blue pages, and sometimes we would go to the pink pages and the yellow pages. We would have changes, and often you get blue pages on TV. With Michael, you would go to pink and yellow because he would get ideas. We would be halfway into the episode couple of days in and he'd go i have this great idea and you would come in the next day and go surprise and you would get new pages oh, cool. it, was, it was very exciting we were on our toes quite a lot yeah <laughs> well uh, i learned at that point that those were <laughs> oh i can just he's like wait what next scene <laughs> yeah no idea yeah, the one time he gave me a new scene that was particularly good, I uh, it was the episode where I was pregnant and eating pickles and ice cream. And um, he was like, well, do you want to spit it in a bucket? And I said, no, I like pickles and ice cream, and you've seen me eat lunch. I can totally do this, and what am I going to do, two takes? I'll be fine. And then I was like, mwahaha, because I did do it in two takes, and I ate the pickle and the ice cream, and I laughed. And he decided I, I had mocked his authority. 
So the next day he handed me pages and he had written a scene where I was now eating pickles with maple syrup. <laughs> Luckily, I can say that that they actually don't taste half bad. Dill pickles, maple syrup are totally edible. So I survived. But it was pretty funny. <laughs> he was like, here, do this then. Ha! <laughs> Too funny. What, what a legacy show that is. It was just amazing. amazing, but it's it's so amazing that you know you were on Highway to Heaven, and and then we were together in a movie, which is crazy, which is out there. You can get you can get the DVDs of it actually. That's right, Last Place on Earth. Last Place on Earth, and it was a, a cute little. It was a cute little film. It's not a blockbuster yeah. thing, but it was, it was very cute. You were great. Um, now, did you work under like another name? Because I was looking try IMDb, I and I'm like, how many people yeah. are you? <laughs> it's I did. I did. You know, uh, well, uh, after Troy killed mom and I decided I was going to write about it, I had another brother out here, Greg, mm. who was trying to be an agent. And he said, Tom, if you write about Troy killing mom, that's going to make me look bad. So you better change your name. Oh, no. And I did. Oh. Yeah. And he eventually killed himself. So then I went back to my other name. Wow. Okay, so yeah. I guess it, that's it's mental illness has clearly cut a swath through your family here. Well, you know, mental illness is a very vague thing. That kind of covers so, everything. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. It's just so vague. Do you think? Do you think that your brother with the the suicide had was having similar symptoms to your parents' schizophrenic brother, or was it a completely different thing? No, no. no? I, okay. I, I think he, he, yeah, he he was going through some paranoia. Mm. So. Uh, but he was he was in a huge depression. He was uh. in a huge depression. He wanted money, you know. He wanted big money and success, and uh, it didn't work out for him. So uh, yeah, he was pretty devastated that he wasn't being promoted as uh. an agent uh, in the industry, etc. He had some bad things going on. So uh, yeah, I mean it, it's sad because he, he was such a beautiful man and had so much to live for, but he didn't see that. And, well, yeah, and I can see then why you quite sensibly, as you said, chose the path of not letting other people define you. Because I see in Hollywood and with the ex-child stars, with a lot of people I know, the people who have the most problems are they're so emotionally dependent on other people's reactions and other people define them. Well, other people don't think I'm pretty. Other people aren't hiring me to be in the movies. And they just spiral into this depression. And it's it's all based on what other people are thinking. Interesting. Uh huh. I think that's really good insight. So I, I yeah. think you've got the right idea. The the the, <laughs> the less you you hang your 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 dreams and your identity on other people's image of you, the safer you are. Uh huh. Yeah, and and my journey has been kind of solitary in a good way. You know, I'm a very independent soul, and it's like almost every night I listen to near death experiences because that excites me. Really. Or, Walter Walter Russell. Do you know who he is? No, Walter no. Russell? No, you don't. And people should. I mean, he was around, uh, oh, he's just an incredible man that accomplished so much and uh, had like this Buddha wisdom and, and these theories about the universe is only light and, wow. uh, and just the stuff he created. They're, 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 he's quite inspirational. And I'll listen to him again tonight. But that's just to show you that, that yes, my... My what excites me in my journey is about what I breathe in and where I want to go, and it really doesn't have anything to do with what other people are telling me to do. So good. I mean, I guess there's some growth there. That did yeah. sounds like a very smart move, actually. Right. Hey. Well, you know, I'm 56. I guess <laughs> you have some wisdom. Well, you're my <laughs> age. Oh. Is that right? Okay. Yes. Right. Well, you know, we're the like same it? age. I didn't realize that. That's hilarious. How you like it? Eh, some days. <laughs> <laughs> some days I like it. Some days I go, oh my god, I can't believe I'm this old. Um, yeah, it does. does it's weird. Real. It does. Some days it just hits you. You go, I'm wait fifty. How did it get to be fifty six? When, when when did that happen? And and then other days I go, well, yeah, I don't look too bad, and and I feel pretty good, and you know, I I'm healthy, so I should go. Yeah, it is it's a good fifty six. And what sucks about being a celebrity is that you, when you're on dating sites, you can't hide your age. Right. So you have to, you have to tell, 
<laughs> these guys that you're 56. And, and, Thank and God I married. Sound too exciting. <laughs> Luckily, luckily, thank I married it. Married. Thank God, I married it. Don't have to go on dating sites. Yes, no, that would be like that would be yes. several phases of hell. I think in this day and age. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been married? Twenty five years this month. And what's the secret for twenty five years? I don't know. Well, we were friends before we started dating. It was like that movie when Harry met Sally. We were friends for like seven oh, yeah? years. Yeah, totally. And then finally, we went on a date. So we kind of got all the small talk out of the way. <laughs> okay. But, uh, okay, great. I mean, 25 years. Uh, most people don't make it that long. No, so no. We were kind of like, we've, we're on the same page about the important things. We feel similarly about things. That seems to work. We're terribly different people. Very different interests and hobbies and things. And when we first got together, people were like, Bob and Allison, what? But then when they finally like saw us together, they went, oh, wait, yeah, no, that, yeah, yeah hello, okay, yeah. Uh -huh. So maybe that helps your relationship that you guys have different interests. Oh, I think so. I think that the fact that uh -huh. we are very different people, we allow each other to be different people. We don't expect each other to be a photocopy of ourselves. I think that's enormous. Uh -huh. Letting the other person do their thing. And not expecting them to just like be you. That did that did not going to last. Plus, you've got such a great sense of humor. Does he as well? Yes, he's hilarious. Okay, that helps, right? Enormously. Yeah, you have yeah. fun. You're having fun. Yes. You're, not, you're not hating each other <laughs> alone. You know, as ten years, eleven years, twelve years, thirteen. Because there's a lot of those people that hate each other. It is. It's <laughs> like it's together. like the Bataan death march of the mayor. Yes, it's no, no. Oh. No, a lot of people. Yeah. They, they, we've had people accuse us of being newlyweds. They go, oh, you guys just like get married recently? Because <laughs> you're much too nice to each other. Usually people 25 years, they can't stand each other. So, Oh, that's so cool. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, because it's tough to be around a couple that are mean to each other. You know, but oh, God, it's so horrible. You know, <laughs> it's like embarrassing yeah. when you... <laughs> yeah. Well, you sound like you got your head screwed on up there in the woods, and I think you're going to... I. I think people are going to go wild over this book. I think that there's people going to be shocked. There's people who are probably going to have a fit and say, "Oh, it's terrible! You shouldn't talk about these things." But I think you're, I think you're going to get a very positive response. Yeah, thanks. So far, the reaction has been very positive from the people that have read it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled you came on the show. And um, as I said, you know, I, this one will, you know, you'll get a copy at all. And um, I, you know. People now they know about the book. They definitely know it's not for the faint of heart. That it's definitely um, was it rated NC seventeen R? Where we? <laughs> that would be rated X. I think. It would definitely be rock. It's it, rated it, X, X, just yeah. flat out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm naked in it, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I talk about sex pretty blatantly, but I do add humor to it. Awesome. Yeah, it would be X. Okay. Well, for those of you who wish to read my lovely friend Tom Beard's incredibly X-rated and fabulous book. Uh, where do they get your book? Well, uh, you know, if people could go to TomBeards.com. TomBeards.com. Uh, my... And that's that. Yeah, is, my, and, uh... and it's B-I-E-R-D-Z. T-H-O-M. B-I-E-R-D-Z.com. There. Yeah, then there'll there'll be four of my books there available. Oh, great. And videos on what the books are about. And Excellent. And also my artwork and a thousand of my prints are there for just 35 bucks each and my, my whole biography so uh and even the amazon links so if they can still go to amazon and get my book if they prefer or if they order from my site of course i can autograph it at that point excellent so you know how folks is. you get an autograph yeah. copy go on amazon or you can go to tombeards.com well thank you for coming and um hey it was a pleasure it was great to talk to you this and, is great. you know, I just wanted to tell you that, you know, everybody should think so highly of you. Everybody. Oh, every time your name is brought up, everybody loves you. Well, see, here we're talking about not that. worrying about what other people think, and then you're telling me everybody likes me. I, I <laughs> Now what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You got me there. Uh, let me think on that. I'll, get, I'll well, get back to you. I suppose it's better than saying I, I, everyone can't stand you, Allison. So that's, that's good to know. It's good. I'm glad that I'm generally a nice person. I'm glad they like me. Good. All right, well, thank you for coming, and this has been the Allison Arngram Show, and I'm Allison Arngram. I'm on my way.